Can everyone uh, hear me reasonably well? So thanks for uh, sticking around so late in the day. My name is Steve Anderson. I'm an abdominal radiologist here at Boston University, and I'll be discussing some uh, concepts related to imaging and image-guided intervention uh, in clinical medicine. And what I'd like to do is introduce some various aspects of imaging in the clinical care of cancer patients um, and focus both on diagnostic imaging, pure diagnostic imaging, including uh, screening, as well as image-guided interventions. And uh, throughout the talk, we'll highlight what I consider to be some limitations of current approaches and maybe um, some future prospects, at least, at least in my opinion. We'll focus on two cancers as, as model systems to discuss imaging uh, in cancer care. We'll look at hepatocellular carcinoma and we'll look at colorectal carcinoma. And we'll start, with, we'll start each cancer with a clinical vignette. So the first uh, topic will be hepatocellular carcinoma. And we'll start with patient HT, a 46-year-old male with hepatitis B who's undergoing ultrasound screening for the detection of, of cancer. And uh, unfortunately, this screening examination on the ultrasound image that you see here, they, uh, we've detected a suspicious looking area in the liver, which looks a little darker than the, the surrounding normal appearing liver parenchyma. So a highly suspicious finding in a patient with hepatitis B that we're screening for cancer. Next step in this patient was to uh, undergo a diagnostic uh, MRI for confirmation of this finding. And you can see uh, here on these MRI images, we have a very bright aorta, which is basically the major uh, pipe that supplies blood to the abdomen. Um, so we've given a contrast agent, a gadolinium-based um, contrast agent in this case. And um, we can see in the liver, in the area of suspicion, we can see abnormal increased signal intensity consistent with arterial inflow of this um, contrast agent confirming our diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. From this uh, imaging study, uh, somewhat atypically, as we'll get to uh, momentarily, this patient under actually underwent percutaneous liver biopsy, an image-guided procedure. Again, we've, we're applying ultrasound technology to guide a small needle into the area of suspicion. Basically, we use a coaxial approach, so we use a small 17-gauge needle, park that in the tumor, and through that little needle, we can um, acquire using a smaller biopsy device as many samples as we want. And during this procedure, we usually have a cytopathologist on hand looking at the specimens through the microscope, uh, confirming adequacy of the sample, such that we're not simply biopsying areas of necrosis or hemorrhage, et cetera. And from there, this patient, unfortunately, was uh, not amenable to having a surgical resection of this tumor and was also not a liver transplant candidate. So the patient underwent an image-guided intervention for, uh, for therapy. Uh, and this patient happened to go undergo um, transarterial chemoembolization in which a small catheter is inserted in a major uh, artery in the groin. It's advanced into the aorta and it's advanced into the uh, arteries supplying the liver and then into the arteries that are actually supplying this tumor. And you can see here this, uh, this small, uh, small catheter coming up into the aorta and out into the liver. And you can see this abnormal blush of contrast uh, signifying the tumor itself. And so through that catheter, we'll then instill uh, both a particulate embolic agent to decrease arterial inflow to the tumor, as well as a chemotherapeutic agent. So transarterial chemoembolization, or TACE, uh, one of the therapies for, um, for hepatocellular carcinoma. Subsequent to that procedure, patient underwent contrast-enhanced CT scan to evaluate for, um, for, to evaluate the therapy, to evaluate for residual disease or recurrent disease, et cetera. And we can see uh, exactly what we were hoping for, which is that the tumor is now a dark hole in the liver without evidence of blood supply, without evidence of suspicious areas of tumor recurrence. Several months go by and patient continues to get ongoing uh, non-invasive imaging evaluation of this area of the liver, both to look for recurrence locally as well as the development of new tumors. Because as we'll discuss, the ultimate therapy for these patients is liver transplantation. And short of that, we're still going to be dealing with a sick liver in most cases. So throughout the talk, I'd also like to just really give the basics of some of these imaging modalities that we're discussing. So let's introduce ultrasound imaging, which can give us images of various parts of the body, such as these. Uh, so liver and kidney here with some free fluid surrounding the liver, a little bit of free fluid surrounding the lung. We've probably all seen images like this, 3D images of a fetal face uh, in pregnant patients. 
uh, power Doppler images of renal arteries uh, like that, uh, looking at the vasculature of the, of the renal cortex in this case. Uh, we can also interrogate uh, blood supply quite elegantly, uh, looking at direction of blood flow, red typically coming towards us, blue going away by convention. We can look at velocity of blood flow. We can look at velocity over time and get a lot of information about uh, vasculature, about, um, about tumors based on, their, uh, based on their vasculature. And basically, very, very simplistically or fundamentally, what we do with ultrasound is um, uh, propagate an ultrasound pulse, which is basically a sound wave, into the tissue. And at tissue interfaces, uh, we will expect to have some uh, reflected pulse, which we then can receive uh, at, this, at the ultrasound transducer. So ultrasound is a real-time imaging modality. A handheld transducer is placed onto the area of interest, and we can acquire images, images like this. Uh, low cost, very flexible, um, no ionizing radiation are uh, significant advantages. Uh, one of the main disadvantages is we're only getting a little window into the body. So you can imagine that we're not going to be able to really make sure that we interrogate the entirety of the liver uh, for something like screening. Uh, so one of the limitations. Um, so basically we uh, propagate an ultrasound pulse. Some of the pulses will continue on through the tissue. Others will be reflected at tissue interfaces and we can be begin to build a picture such as this of the liver. So let's move on uh, in our discussion of HCC, which represents the most common liver cancer. And worldwide, the fifth most common tumor in men, eighth most common in women. Given its aggressive nature, it represents the third most common cause of cancer-related death, and accounts for about a half a million deaths worldwide annually. Most cases of hepatocellular carcinoma are caused by under underlying chronic liver disease, and most commonly, uh, viral hepatitis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or NASH, which is now the most common liver disease in America, closely related to the obesity epidemic, and alcohol use. And very importantly, HCC represents the most rapidly increasing cause of can cancer death in the U.S., all due to the rising rates of these underlying fundamental etiologies of this disease. And what we know about HCC is that early stage tumors, unfortunately, are asymptomatic. So patients won't present with pain, et cetera. And in these cases, in early stage tumors, the survival is relatively decent, greater than 50% five-year survival. Unfortunately, once the patients become symptomatic, uh, the stage of the tumor typically precludes surgery based on tumor size, based on patient health, based on the presence of metastases. And at this point, uh, five-year survival really drops. So it's important that we pick up these early stage tumors, which unfortunately are asymptomatic. So screening plays a great, uh, has a great opportunity uh, in this case. And screening algorithms using ultrasound, which is what are typically applied, have been demonstrated to decrease mortality based on one study nearly 40%. Current guidelines by um, several of the, the major societies um, suggest that ultrasound is done at six to 12 month intervals for patients at high risk for hepatocellular carcinoma, which basically are the patients with those uh, major risk factors I discussed. Um, one of the major societies recommends against using alpha fetoprotein, which is a serum biomarker, in screening, in the cases of screening, if ultrasound is available, basically because it has a false positive rate which drives up cost and adds about $1,000 per tumor detection. So the recommendations are simply to use ultrasound in isolation. A lot of these guidelines aren't really strictly adhered to in the clinic. How good is ultrasound? Um, based on some of the literature, uh, it does fairly well in detecting hepatocellular carcinoma in the screening setting. Uh, any tumor, any size, sensitivity specificity in the low 90s, sensitivity for early tumors, which is really what we're interested in here, not quite as good, but I'd say both of these numbers in our clinical experience is prob are probably very optimistic. I don't think it fares quite this well in practice. Typical ultrasound images of hepatocellular carcinoma, a large, well-circumscribed tumor with color Doppler. We can see uh, the presence of vascularity, suggesting that this is vascularized solid tissue, highly suspicious in this patient population. And what we do after we see that nodule on ultrasound screening really depends on the size of the nodule. So if it's big and we have typical CT or MRI features and an AFP that's elevated, so now AFP does play a role, it's diagnostic. We don't need to get tissue to, um, to go on to treat these tumors. These are considered diagnostic studies. The patient can have a surgery or a liver transplant, 
radio frequency ablation, et cetera, just based on imaging. Smaller nodules, um, the guidelines up to now have been to do both CT and MRI, and they, they both agree and they're typical, then we can consider that diagnostic. The trend is going towards simply doing one imaging study, whether it be CT or MRI, or even ultrasound with some of the newer contrast agents. Small nodules, recommendations suggest short interval follow-up ultrasound. In practice, it's probably short interval follow-up MRI, at least in, at, uh, at our institution. On CT and MRI, what we're looking for are, um, is evidence of arterial enhancement. I'll show you an example of this momentarily. And what we call portal venous washout. And when we see those imaging criteria on either one of these modalities, we can consider that to be diagnostic. CT does fairly well, sensitivity 75% for all size tumors, but it really drops when we're talking about smaller lesions. MRI, probably a little better, especially some of the newer MRI techniques. But again, when, it, when we get to smaller tumors, it really starts to drop as far as the sensitivity to the detection of additional nodules other than the one that we're bringing the patient to, to MRI for. So here are typical imaging features of a rather infiltrative hepatocellular carcinoma on CT. And we have arterial to your left and portal venous phase images to your right. And what we mean by phases of contrast enhancement or arterial and portal venous is simply which vascular structure is the brightest on this image. So on the arterial phase, this, this bright uh, white artery and this bright, slightly smaller artery represent arteries. So this is an arterial phase of image acquisition. And in this case, typical features are that the tumor relative to the normal parenchyma is slightly brighter. There's increased arterial inflow in hepatocellular carcinoma when compared to the normal liver. In the portal venous phase, what we expect to see are that portal veins are about as bright as they're ever going to be. The aorta, you can see now, is slightly darker than it was earlier. And the, the tumor itself is starting to wash out because the portal vein is supplying the majority of the blood supply to the liver, but the tumor gets the majority of its blood supply from the arteries. So by this point in time, it's washing out. We expect to see a relative darkening of the tumor, and these are considered very typical imaging appearances of HCC. Uh, additional CT images, another patient, two images of the same patient, huge tumor at the dome of the liver here. This is all tumor with additional areas of arterial enhancement throughout this liver, really diagnostic of uh, multifocal HCC, dominant tumor at the dome of the liver, additional smaller nodules identified throughout the remainder of this liver. On MRI, same principle, arterial phase, portal venous phase, typically acquire an additional slightly later phase, which we call the equilibrium phase, two to three minutes after we inject the contrast material. Same principle, we're looking for brightness on the arterial phase with washout over time, and we can see some bright areas in this liver on the early phase with uh, a gradual darkening multifocal HCC with some fairly significant dominant nodules uh, more centrally. So very simplistically, MRI, the fundamentals of MRI image acquisition. In the clinic, what we're typically imaging when we generate images such as what we've sh I've shown you are, um, we're, we're typically looking at protons of water. So without the application of external field, though the magnetization of those water protons are completely random. But when we apply a very strong magnetic field, such as what we do with MRI, which typically in the clinic now is 1.5 or 3 Tesla, some clinical systems are going up to 7T, preclinical systems have broken the 20 Tesla barrier, uh, we, we get what we call a net magnetization which I consider to be a potential energy that we can then use to uh, generate some signal and some images. So this is what a, a standard clinical MRI looks like. And B0, which is, the, um, which is the external magnetic field of the magnet coming out along the long axis of the bore. So once we put the patient or the patient's water protons into this field, we're going to get this net magnetization and this potential energy which is illustrated by this vertically oriented dark arrow on the leftward aspect of this image. And then through a series of uh, radio frequency pulses, we're going to manipulate this uh, longitudinal magnetization and tip it towards the horizontal plane, at which point it begins to process about the B0, the vertical uh, axis in this case, and generate signal, which we can then receive with coils that are placed in and about the body. 
And based on the specific parameters of those applications of those radio frequency pulses, such as how far we tip into the horizontal plane, how long we wait to receive signal after the tipping occurs, or how long, uh, how long until we repeat the tipping procedure, we can generate different uh, types of soft tissue contrast. So MRI is really flexible. Downsides include cost. It's of the three that we've discussed, or will discuss, the most expensive imaging modality. Time consuming, 30 to 45 minutes uh, for a typical clinical MRI examination. Uh, no radiation is a significant benefit. The bore, as you saw, is, is pretty small, so claustrophobia becomes an issue in the clinic. And what we can do, but based on uh, the parameters of these radio frequency pulse applications, is generate contrast. So we're going to look at some changes in contrast based on differences in uh, RF pulse application. Uh, in this case, we're going to change the contrast, uh, the weighting of the contrast based on T1 relaxation time, which is just a fundamental property of tissue in an external magnetic field. And as we change that, we can see the contrast of this, in this case, a brain and the neck, really change uh, simply based on the timing of those RF pulses. So it's a really uh, flexible modality, and we here really have unlimited um, an unlimited capability of generating different types of contrast. And we have a really inherent, a high uh, contrast within soft tissues, uh, much more so than, than the other imaging modalities. This is just an example of a really high field clinical system um, for imaging small animals, tissue samples. This happens to be 700 megahertz, so 16.4 uh, Tesla system. So continuing our discussion, liver biopsy is currently recommended for, um, for further diagnosis of atypical or lesions that have atypical imaging appearances or small lesions. And major complications that we always consider when we do a procedure like this include bleeding, significant bleeding leading to death, uh, as well as tumor seeding. 30% of patients will experience some sort of pain. 0.3% have severe complications, including major hemorrhage. And while small, the, the mortality uh, rate is present. Uh, needle track seeding, which means that we're uh, seeding the abdominal cavity or the abdominal wall, chest wall with tumor, uh, occurs in up to a few percent uh, based on the literature. This is a patient that suffered a major complication after a percutaneous biopsy here. And we can see a very normal looking liver. And surrounding the liver, this crescent of high signal uh, represents a large hematoma with some blood tracking around the liver, at, around the gallbladder. In this case, the patient was not doing very well. And technically, these procedures are all fairly straightforward. So there's nothing technically that goes wrong to induce something like this. It's completely random, very rare. But when it happens, we, we get CT images like this. This patient was immediately uh, taken to CT scan for further evaluation. And we can see on contrast-enhanced examination, a lot of blood around the liver, a lot of blood throughout the abdominal cavity around the spleen. And in the area of biopsy, there's a defect in the liver. And what you see is this little bright signal adjacent to that de defect. And what that re represents is iodine within the arterial blood ac actively leaking out of the artery. So we're visualizing this patient bleeding on the table, on the CT scan table. So obviously, um, a fairly urgent uh, uh, intervention is demanded in this case. This patient was taken to the interventional suite, in this case a catheter, again, placed into the groin, into the aorta, into the liver. In this case, we're going to um, we're going to deliver embolic agents, not for purposes of treating a tumor, but for purposes of stopping that act of bleeding, which you can see here as this little irregular blush of contrast. So particles or some type of gel foam is delivered into the artery that's bleeding uh, to stop this, this hemorrhage. So really significant uh, complication treated, but uh, a significant cost uh, to the patient. Um, as far as therapy, one possible, as I alluded to, transplantation really is considered the primary therapy for these patients because their livers th are fundamentally uh, sick. Um, unfortunately, there's very strict selection criteria for patients to undergo liver transplantation based on the fact that there's simply not enough livers available for all the patients that need them. Short of that, uh, many patients are unable to have an operative intervention to resect their tumors um, based on other comorbid factors, heart disease, kidney disease, et cetera. Their liver function is often very abnormal. Uh, late diagnoses with metastases uh, distant to the liver uh, would preclude a surgery. So in these cases, image-guided therapy is a really a nice option if surgery is contraindicated or as a bridge to transplant as a patient sits on the transplant list and waits for their new liver, uh, this uh, therapy is a, is a really good option. 
And a lot of image-guided therapies have been explored, percutaneous ablation, including injection of things like uh, ethanol, acetic acid, boiling saline. We can modulate the temperature using percutaneous probes. We can heat the tumors using radiofrequency or microwave ablation. We can freeze tumor using cryotherapy. It's a great choice. The percutaneous ablations are great choices for smaller tumors, really focal therapies. In the case of large tumors or more infiltrative tumors, uh, the choice is probably transarterial chemoembolization uh, in, in those cases. And this is just one example of a uh, radiofrequency ablation in a patient with hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, on an arterial enhanced MRI, you can see the aorta is very bright. The gadolinium agent was again delivered. We can see a little area of abnormal arterial enhancement, highly suspicious in this patient population. The patient undergoes radiofrequency ablation under ultrasound, uh, a needle, very much like the percutaneous biopsy needle we showed uh, previously, is placed into the liver, into that tumor, and from there the patient is transferred into the CT suite, and uh, at this point you can see the, the biopsy device or the percutaneous uh, radiofrequency uh, abl ablation device in this case, with several tines emanating from its tip. A CT will be the modality of uh, monitoring this therapy because, because once we increase the temperature and develop some gas within the tissue, ultrasound becomes uh, fairly useless uh, for looking at the tissue. And we'll basically um, drive electrical current through this probe, heating the tissue locally, and we get an effect like this. Before and after, before an MRI, after, immediately after the procedure, contrast enhanced CT, we can see this large RF burn zone, tumor and the surrounding tissue. A great choice for local therapy. So as you can see, imaging really has integrated itself into all aspects of uh, imaging, including screening, uh, using ultrasound diagnosis, CT, MRI, and image-guided biopsies, as well as therapy for patients with hepatocellular carcinoma, ablation, and, uh, and TACE. In my opinion, some of the things that are on the horizon for uh, HCC screening include the increasing use of contrast agents for ultrasound. There are commercially available contrast agents for ultrasound, which uh, unfortunately are not available in the United States as they lack FDA approval, but we can expect to increase the diagnostic uh, sensitivity of, these, uh, of this modality for these tumors, which is really what we're after in screening. But we may also be able to preclude the need for subsequent characterization using CT and MRI. Because we can see arterial hyperenhancement and portal venous washout, we may not need to spend the time and money to go to CT or MRI for more definitive characterization of these tumors. Another very interesting approach uh, is um, uses x-ray. Not to discount x-ray, simple x-ray, uh, which is uh, very interesting. There are some novel approaches to generating x-ray images, such as scatter x-ray, which was used in this, uh, in this paper, such as face contrast x-rays with the addition of some contrast agents, such as metal-based contrast agents, and maybe we can consider screening for tumors, if not in the first world, at least in the uh, third world setting, where cost is really a consideration and so some of this expensive technology is not available, screening for cancer using x-rays, not standard x-rays, but some uh, novel x-rays and uh, maybe some metal-based nanoparticles. In this uh, very recent and really interesting paper, uh, looking at simply uh, cell pellets of uh, hepatoma cells with gold nanoparticles, really uh, demonstrating a difference in signal simply on x-ray. As far as diagnosis, I think there's a lot of potential for MRI to more uh, effectively characterize the liver tumors that we identify. This is an image of a diffusion-weighted uh, MRI image, which generates contrast based on differences in uh, rates of water molecule diffusion through tissue. And it's been demonstrated that not only does this technique increase sensitivity to the detection of small tumors, somewhere in the order of 5 to 15 percent versus just gadolinium enhanced MRI, but it says a lot about tumor biology um, as the uh, increasing grades of tumors seem to decrease diffusion rates. So it may tell us a lot about tumor biology. It may help us prognosticate some of the therapies that we uh, intend to deliver to these patients. As far as therapy, one of the exciting completely non-invasive therapeutics, image-guided therapeutics, is the use of HIFU or high-intensity focused ultrasound, which uses uh, focused ultrasound to generate local heat. It's often uh, monitored using MRI because we can make color maps, as we see here on the left. The color represents temperature, which we can uh, monitor using MRI, and we can deliver local burns to the tissue without the application of some kind of percutaneous device. 
So let's briefly touch on the underpinnings of CT, which also uses x-ray similar to this simple chest x-ray that we have here, which is a 2D image which superimposes all this 3D information onto this simple image. And what we'd like to do is get more of this three-dimensional image out using a tomographic technique. And that's what CT represents. And what we have uh, represented here is an x-ray source in, this, in green and a detector array. Typically in modern CT scanners, we're talking about a detector array, so multiple detectors, multi-detector CT, 16, 64, all the way up to 320 detectors. And these move in synchrony and acquire uh, raw data, such as uh, uh, what's illustrated here in the upper row. And that raw data can then be processed to generate our tomographic image. What's typically done is uh, what's called filtered back projection um, to generate an image like this. Uh, more recently, uh, filtered back projection is being replaced by a technique called iterative reconstruction, computationally slightly more intensive or significantly more intensive um, in an effort to decrease the radiation. Um, um, that's necessary to make images like this. But you can see a tomographic image which gives us all the three-dimensional information. Advantages of CT include speed. We can image from head to toe in 10 seconds with 600 micron isotropic resolution. Downsides are radiation. But I think those will be significantly mitigated in the coming years. Uh, ACER has the potential to decrease radiation uh, by an order of magnitude at least. Uh, sorry, ACER, that, that means iterative reconstruction. And what CT generates, that generates contrast based on x-ray attenuation, which fundamentally um, uses differences in density. And the um, attenuation is normalized to water, such that uh, water uh, is assigned a Hounsfield unit, is the, the terminology for, um, for the contrast, the grayscale that's used to represent the data. Water has a Hounsfield unit attenuation of zero. Anything with less uh, x-ray attenuation or less density uh, has a negative Hounsfield unit attenuation associated with it. Anything with a greater x-ray attenuation, a positive value. So let's move on to discuss the uh, second cancer, colorectal cancer. We'll start again with a clinical vignette. Patient TA, 64-year-old male, undergoing a screening CT colonography which is basically a CT scan used to screen uh, for cancer. We just passed a polyp, a very suspicious polyp, and now we're looking at a large cancer in the colon. So this technique uses a slightly different approach than just standard CT scan in the sense that we need to instill air into the colon to get it distended. And what we do is put a small rectal tube into the patient and instill carbon dioxide on the order of five to six liters to give us this nice distension. And in the 24 hours leading up to this x-ray, we'll have the patient prep their colon by drinking a few liters of a liquid to cleanse the colon and get rid of any debris or stool that may interfere with image quality like this. And from here, this patient uh, underwent optical colonoscopy, standard colonoscopy using a colonoscope for tissue biopsy. Subsequent to that, the patient underwent a contrast-enhanced CT for staging to look for uh, uh, distant metastases to look at the tumor, to look for any lymph nodes associated with that in the abdomen and pelvis. And here we can see the primary tumor in the colon. And we can unfortunately also see a lot of dark areas in the liver, throughout the liver, consistent with hepatic metastases. So this patient's presenting with a large primary tumor and with a tumor that's already gone to the liver, which is quite common in this, in this patient population. So now the patient undergoes uh, PET-CT for whole body staging. And these are just PET images, uh, it's kind of rotating uh, projection of PET images. And we can see the primary tumor, hypermetabolic. This uses a contrast agent that basically gives us a map of metabolism. So this is quite metabolically active, this primary tumor. And we can see a lot of, of the dark areas in the liver on CT are also metabolically active, consistent with metastases, as we suspected. This patient then underwent MRI to establish a baseline for uh, monitoring of his therapy, which in this case was um, the delivery of a chemotherapeutic agent. And we can see on this uh, MRI image, uh, the bright areas in the liver, throughout the liver, are consistent with the patient's tumor. Subsequent MRIs upon um, uh, the delivery of several cycles of chemotherapy demonstrate significant interval decrease of these tumors, which you can now see small residual disease, which on PET-CT really didn't show any metabolic activity, which unfortunately, after uh, several uh, additional cycles of imaging, 
did, um, did demonstrate uh, recurrence of disease and eventual progression of disease, which is unfortunately often the case. Colorectal carcinoma represents the third most common cancer in men and women. In 2010, just over 140,000 new diagnoses and about 50,000 deaths in the U.S. from this cancer alone, and over $12 billion spent yearly in this country based uh, for this cancer alone. For screening, similar to hepatoma, early stage detection is associated with high survival rates, and late stage detection is associated with poor survival. So it's important to detect this tumor early, as is the case for most cancers. And the guidelines suggest that we use fecal occult blood testing, which basically looks for blood within stool samples, or sigmoidoscopy, which means uh, using an uh, optical scope to evaluate the end of the colon every five years, or colonoscopy, which evaluates the entirety of the colon every 10 years, beginning at age 50, continuing to age 75. Not all of the societies and uh, major players in giving these guidelines always completely agree. Some of them, uh, a lot of them, do also include imaging in the screening algorithms, including the American Cancer Society, which suggests double contrast barium enema at five-year intervals, or CT colonography, which I showed you images of, at five-year intervals. A lot of politics behind these kind of guidelines. Double contrast barium enema, in our mind, is probably uh, not as relevant in uh, 2012 as it used to be before the advent of CT colonography, but it's definitely still used in some, uh, in some areas, uh, even in this country. In this case, we're getting an x-ray of the colon after we insufflate it with air and put in a contrast agent which, co which coats the inner, line, inner lining of the, uh, of the colon. And we can see, in this case, a large polyp. It's very insensitive to the small tumors that we're quite interested in detecting. A large tumor within near the end of the colon. Another quite large tumor near the end of the colon in this case. CTC performance varies based on the study, as expected, but it does very well. Comparing it to what's considered the gold standard, optical colonoscopy, sensitivity for the detecting the sizes that we're interested in, greater than or equal to 10, or even greater than or equal to 6 millimeters, which is probably the, the, the smallest that we'd be interested in, is very similar. Sensitivity about 90% for the larger cutoff, and slightly less than that for the smaller cutoff. Ongoing. Uh, controversies or discussions regarding, regarding perforation rates in CTC because there is an installation of a rectal tube. Uh, ongoing discussion of radiation, which again should be mitigated in the relatively near future. What to do about the small lesions. If we see them on CTC, do we really need to go to optical colonoscopy for their removal? We ob obviously can't remove them with CT. As well as some ongoing uh, debate about the cost efficacy of these uh, two um, screening modalities uh, have really limited its more widespread implementation. It's currently not, uh, not paid for by Medicare, but there are several pockets in the country in which private insurers have found it in their, in their own interest and in the patient's interest to, um, to reimburse it. So it is being used as a screening modality, and we expect it to be reimbursed much more widely in the relatively near future. We'd like to catch these, screen these tumors on screening, but sometimes they present late with symptoms, such as in this case, patient presented with a very large tumor near the end of the colon here, on the frontal image here. And upstream from that, the colon is quite distended, causing this patient a lot of pain. In these patients, once we've diagnosed their tumor, hopefully by screening, sometimes with their clinical presentation, we'll go on to stage the tumor to evaluate uh, its extent both locally and distant. We'll do a CT of the abdomen pelvis and a chest x-ray prior to surgery. We're looking for wall invasion, local lymph node, distant metastases. There's some examples of a patient similar to the, uh, the, the vignette I introduced uh, this topic with, of a patient with liver metastases on CT, frontal images of a CT imaging. And you can see numerous uh, hepatic metastases, which are uh, very common in this, in this patient population. One interesting application of imaging in uh, a specific location of colorectal cancer, in the rectum we know that local recurrence rates after surgery are unacceptably high. So imaging, specifically MRI, is being applied to determine the risk of local returns based on a, the, the, um, the soft tissue characterization, the capability to characterize the local anatomy of using MRI. 
and determine the roles of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery in these cases. And the important things that we're looking at are the integrity of the wall of the rectum, resection margins, local invasion, and uh, any evidence of lymph nodes in the pelvis. And this is an example of an MRI of a patient with rectal carcinoma. And so we're really interested in local staging around this, around this tumor. You can see a large rectal cancer on a frontal image on an MRI and a sagittal image uh, on an MRI, a large cancer. After gadolinium contrast administration, you can see the extent of this tumor in and around the rectum, a lot of small lymph nodes about the tumor. So the size, how closely it approximates some of the resection margins uh, during surgery, all important uh, indicators of whether or not this patient should have surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation, or any, any, uh, any combination of the three. And we can also see some large lymph nodes in this patient. Colorectal carcinoma represents the most common metastases to the liver. Over half of patients with this cancer will have metastases to the liver at some point in their care. Surgical resection of these liver metastases has been shown to improve five-year survival rates. And as patients with this cancer are living longer, their comorbid conditions, their heart disease, et cetera, are becoming a significant consideration, and they may not be able to undergo surgery. So image-guided therapy, again, plays a big role in treating these uh, areas of metastases. And it's the same um, image-guided therapies that we discussed for HCC, typically RF, microwave, or cryotherapy for local ablation of these uh, liver lesions. And the overall survival rates have been reported to approach that of surgery. And here's an example of a patient that had some uh, some novel so, or some interesting image-guided uh, interventions done to their metastases. This patient had uh, several fairly uh, large liver metastases in the right lobe of the liver and a slightly smaller lesion in the left lobe of the liver. So what the surgeon wants to do here is remove a very large chunk of the right lobe of the liver and a slightly smaller chunk of the left lobe of the liver, just removing this tumor. But unfortunately, we can do the volume analysis of this liver. There's not enough liver to, um, to sustain the patient if we do the surgery now. Also note the small uh, lung metastases at the, the base of the left lung in this case. So what we did was embolize the portal vein, which is the vascular structure which supplies most of the blood to the liver. We embolized the portal vein feeding the right lobe of the liver, which causes a reflex hypertrophy of the left lobe. So we're basically going to grow the left lobe larger so we can do the surgery that surgeon wants to do, which is remove a huge section of the right lobe of the liver. And we're also going to put a small needle into this little nodule under CT guidance so the surgeon has a landmark, basically can operate along that needle to find this subsonometer uh, lung metastases and effectively treat this patient. Uh, so after their liver surgery, you can see that the left lobe is really uh, significantly hypertrophied. The right lobe, a lot of it has been lost. And we've uh, resected this small pulmonary metastases. So what I see is, uh, as for the evolution of colorectal cancer imaging and therapy, as far as image-guided therapies, for screening, I think um, computer-aided detection really sh is going to play a significant role in colorectal, um, in CT colonography. It, uh, evaluating these CT scans in a screening population takes us a lot of time. Where I can look at a standard CT scan in three to five minutes, it takes us at least 20 minutes to look for this screening, to look through this screening study. So to make it economically viable and to maintain a high diagnostic accuracy in this unfortunately rel relatively boring screening population where most of the examinations are negative, CAD or computer aid detection is going to play a significant role. And the diagnostic accuracies of the, of the CAD systems that are um, being implemented into the clinic are, are pretty impressive. As far as diagnosis for this tumor, as well as uh, many other malignancies and many other diseases, the hybrid modality that's been introduced into the clinic very recently, PET MRI, which fuses the technology of, of MRI and positron emission tomography into a single machine. Uh, really offers uh, a lot of potential. So we can acquire both MRI, PET data. At the same time, uh, we can fuse the data. For some of the earlier literature on colorectal carcinoma, the sensitivity to the detection of metastases is significantly improved on the order of 15 to 20 percent for lung and liver metastases compared to PET-CT alone. Cost efficacy is still, still an issue to be uh, considered. This is a very expensive technology, but clearly very exciting technology.
As far as therapy for this tumor, as well as many others, this may represent the operating room of the future, which has been which went online uh, several months ago across town at Brigham and Women's Hospital, an operating room in, a, in a, basically a three-room suite, an operating room flanked by a ceiling-mounted three-tesla MRI, which can roll into the operating room to do intraoperative 3T MRI, and uh, in the adjacent room, a PET-CT machine. So intraoperative PET CT combining all of the really powerful imaging modalities for cancer into an operating room setting. And I think that the potential for this type of uh, scenario is really uh, just, they're just beginning to be discovered. So with that, I thank you for uh, your attention this late in the day. So Dr. Anderson uh, has the benefit of not only being a clinician here with us, but a clinician researcher. And I, my question for him is to tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing in the lab and how it um, uh, uh, references to what you presented to us today. So some of the work that we're doing in the lab with some of my engineering collaborators uh, is to use uh, top-down fabrication techniques to make, to fabricate contrast agents, um, to give them unique properties uh, for MRI, we can um, tune some of the frequencies at which they process and give us um, signal based on their geometric properties. So we can basically assign colors to various geometries of a metallic structure in an MRI setting. Other interesting approaches to uh, CAT scan contrast agents are simply to have uh, a particulate um, a contrast agent, which also um, gives it unique features the EPR effect, which I think was briefly discussed previously, but simply to take, uh, to take advantage of some of the differences in the vasculature supplying tumors and other diseased areas that we're interested in. So we're really interested in um, looking at um, nanoparticles for contrast agents, but using top-down fabrication approaches to develop them s to strictly control size and shape, because those things, I think, the print process was also introduced. Those things are being increasingly acknowledged to be very important in drug delivery, uh, biodistribution, clearance, et cetera. So some of the things that I'm interested in doing as far as imaging contrast agents. Dr. Volker. <coughs> so I have two quick questions. You mentioned that there was a contrast agent approved in Europe and not here. Like to say a few words about that. Very typical. What? Yeah. Very typical. The FDA represents a major hurdle, as a lot of us know, to uh, drug um, and contrast agent, which is treated the same way as a drug, uh, into the clinical uh, setting. So we recently had um, a, a new MRI contrast agent introduced into the, into the U.S. commercial market, which had been in Europe for eight or ten years. Uh, so there is a larger hurdle in this country. Uh, for the introduction of those agents. And it's they typically lag uh, by years compared to the European market. Why is it a drug and not a device? Because it's systemically delivered to the body. Right? So it's viewed in the same way. It has the same really high hurdles, clinical trials, a billion dollars, 10 years as a drug. Unfortunately for us, unfortunately for the imagers, the return on the investment is not quite as large as something like Lipitor or Viagra when we're talking about a contrast agent for CAT scan. So there's not as much interest uh, from uh, the moneyed uh, uh, um, agencies to, uh, to invest in, these, uh, in the development of these products. So the agents that we use in, in CT scan, for instance, are decades old and completely outdated. So if you look at preclinical imaging, it's light years beyond what we're using in the clinic, and hopefully some of that will eventually get to the clinic. Uh, but uh, a lot of people are very pessimistic about that. Hi, I'm wondering if there's um, hi, I'm wondering if there's uh, some decent clinical evidence um, for the EPR effect and 
I think contrast agents is probably the easiest way to characterize that. So is, are there some good studies out there that show a correlation between what we would see in an animal model versus what would actually happen in a um, person's tumor? There are some good uh, preclinical studies of uh, EPR effect, uh, um, secondary evidence of EPR effect, basically showing accumulation of a particulate contrast agents in a tumor, for instance, not in the clinic because we're not really dealing with particulate agents in the clinic. The agents that we discussed, iodinated contrast agents in CT, uh, gadolinium-based contrast agents for MRI, are not uh, particulate agents. So the EPR effect doesn't really apply. But there's plenty of preclinical data to suggest that that has a significant effect on uh, improving sensitivity to detecting small tumors simply based on EPR in animals. Yes. Can you comment on the, um, what the x-ray you mentioned? You, you said that you had insufflated the colon and you applied it with a contrast agent for x-ray, but you didn't say anything about yeah, what it's it is um, or, or what kind it's of a bari it's a basically a liquid barium, okay. uh, which is completely inert. It doesn't get absorbed by the colon, and it's it's an agent that has been used for uh, literally decades. From some of the one of the first agents, uh, when X-ray was all we had, to um, it was used to coat the lung. If you can imagine that, so a patient would basically aspirate this barium, and we do lung imaging. Uh, we put it in the colon. It basically just coats, gives us that mucosal relief picture. And we still use it in CAT scan um, to coat the colon and give us um, contrast between colonic wall and uh, the lumen of the gut. But it's, it's a barium-based um, contrast agent. So, so is there like um, desire for improvement or is it already there's a desire, there's with There's definitely with a working? desire for improvement. No one that I know is working on contrast agent uh, for virtual colonoscopy. And I think there's a, big, uh, there's a big market there. I see a lot of preclinical work on agents for optical colonoscopy. But I think the bigger market is, is virtual colonoscopy, something that a uh, patient can drink. It may not have the hurdles to get through uh, uh, if it stays simply within the gut and doesn't get into the systemic circulation. Uh, it may not have the hurdles to get to the clinic, but there's clearly a need to improve sensitivity to the detection of these small tumors uh, on something like virtual colonoscopy. So there's definitely a, a potential there. And then just another question on, so in the very beginning, you, I think it was striking, you said it's like a greater than $2 billion market for the col just for the colon cancer diagnosis. And I could see immediately, because you're saying, oh, you need to have like an ultrasound, then MRI, then after that do CT. And so, so, and what I'm wondering is, is in, in the, the talk about reducing costs, I'm wondering if you can comment, like, like certainly you mentioned with ultrasound, you can maybe reduce costs, but if you do that, you have to use something like, like a targeted ultrasound, which will then bring up your costs, right? Because if, let's say you have an antibody or something. So I'm just wondering if you can comment on just, I mean, it's very impressive, but at the same time, I'm thinking, my God, the, you know, th these are really expensive, um, or, or will the costs come yeah. down? I'm just wondering. Yeah, so um, I mean, the imaging costs are definitely a huge consideration, but they pale in comparison to all the other costs in the OR and inpatient care, et cetera. But they're definitely a target of uh, reducing healthcare costs, imaging in general. Uh, I'd say it's highly overused in our clinical environment, uh, which is. Um, a lot about uh, protecting uh, physicians, and we do a lot of over-imaging for that, for that reason, uh, more so than we need to be. Um, but, uh, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of interest in reducing that, reducing simply the number of times we image. Uh, as far as reducing cost per examination, it's a, definitely something that people are looking to do. Um, but I think these newer technologies, as they continue to be introduced, every new technology always has a, a, a higher bar of cost and always improves our accuracy. So there has to be a decision at some point when enough is enough and we don't need PETAMAR, and we have to, but we have to settle for a lesser technology. And our society right now doesn't do that really well, deciding when to use the best, the costliest, and maybe a second best, but less costly. So that's a huge problem in healthcare in general. So thank you very much to Dr. Anderson. If you have any other questions, please come on afterwards.